This is Ashley McHugh from Insurance Newsnet, and I will be the administrator for today's webinar, The Explosive Rise of Index Products, Can They Be Trusted? Moderating the webinar is John Hilton, Senior Editor at Insurance Newsnet. John has been with INN since 2015, following a long career in newspapers. Our panel today includes Mike Maroney. Mike is Vice President of the Business Development Team for Nationwide Financial's annuity business segment. The group is accountable for ensuring that Nationwide's annuity business delivers strong top and bottom line results while developing high quality retirement solutions for members. Mike has been with Nationwide for 23 years. Also joining us is David Machia. David is an author, entrepreneur, public speaker, and marketing communications expert whose work is focused on improving Americans' retirement security. David is founder of Wealth2K Inc., a leading provider of advisor-centric income planning solutions. He is the creative force behind the popular Income for Life model, as well as Women in Income, the first retirement income solution developed expressly for boomer women. Please ask any questions you may have in the questions pane, and we will get to as many as we can at the end. And with that, I'll turn it over to John. Thank you, Ashley, and, and thank you to everyone for joining us today. We're very excited to have uh, two panelists today representing uh, different segments of the industry. Uh, index products are, are certainly dominating sales charts uh, for both annuities uh, and life insurance. Uh, our panelists are going to discuss why sales are so strong and where they might be headed. And uh, also uh, of great interest to you all, I'm sure, uh, what sales practices are working today. So. Uh, but before we begin, I think, Ashley, you have a uh, poll question for our audience. Yeah, so the first poll that we have is just, what is your role? Are you a financial advisor, an insurance agent, with distribution, a financial company, with an insurance company, support or back office, or you're just interested? We'll give you a moment here to cast your vote. All right, John, it looks like over 50% of our audience uh, are insurance agents. Great. Uh, thanks, Ashley. Uh, uh, when it comes to uh, life insurance or annuity sales, like I said, you, you can't get too far without uh, uh, talking about an index product, whether you're discussing sales or innovation or even uh, a little bit of controversy, uh, an index product is likely front and center. Uh, I'd like to welcome in our panelists here and, and get right to it. Uh, Mike, you know, you've been uh, living this life for a couple decades now and have seen the rise of index products, uh, annuities in particular. Maybe start with a brief introduction about how these uh, indexes work and why these products are so popular. Yeah. Um, so, John, thanks for having me. I appreciate being here. So for me, uh, why are these so popular or, or what's going on? It's aging America. Uh, there's 10,000 baby boomers every day turning 65, right? And so think of what these products can deliver. So number one, they can deliver principal protection or some sort of downside protection. Consumers are saying that's important to them. The second thing they do is they produce income that you can't outlive. That's the second thing that uh, our clients are telling us that uh, is important. So let's go to the very highest level. How do these products work? Okay, so a client agrees to buy an index product. Premium is sent into the insurance carrier. The insurance carrier takes those dollars and goes and buys a portfolio of bonds that they place for FIAs in their general account. And for registered index link or RILAs, they place those bonds in the separate account. Those bonds go and produce a yield for the insurance carrier. We take that yield and we go buy an option on the index the consumer has selected inside the product or multiple index they selected. And it's really simple. If the index is up over the period of time, the option expires with an, uh, a, a value and we can give an index credit to the consumer. If the index is down over that period of time, the option expires without any value and we can't give an index credit. At no time are the dollars ever invested into the index, right? That's a misconception. They're not in the index. They're actually in the general account or separate account of the insurance company. 
So really what consumers are really buying is the credit worthiness of the insurer when they're buying these index products. And so for me, that's why uh, financial strength matters or should be a consideration when you're looking at these types of products. Oh, that's uh, really great stuff, Mike. Uh, I've covered this for a while and never totally understood the options part. So uh, personally, thank you for that. Uh, David, you are uh, obviously coming at this from the advisor space and been at it for a good long time yourself. Uh, tell us a little bit about what you do and how these uh, index products uh, are giving you uh, flexibility in crafting retirement plans for your clients. Great, John. And again, thanks for having me. So I've had a 40-year career, and at the heart of it has always been one sort of strategic objective, which is to help financial advisors grow. But for me, that started out in the 1980s with life insurance, universal life insurance. I developed the first uh, private pension, if you will. And then in the 90s, I got involved very early on with uh, the first index annuities that were developed by Keyport Life Insurance Company, developing the marketing materials for those, because at that time, it sounds strange to say it today, but advisors didn't know how to think about an annuity that had an interest mechanism credited to a stock index. I'll just add to what Mike said. For me, the proposition that underlines index products is the greatest financial proposition ever traded in history. The notion that you can have upside growth potential without downside risk is just an extraordinary thing. And it's accounted for the traumatic, tremendous growth that we've seen in these products. Now, where are index products used? As, as Mike indicated, you know, the ability to create retirement income for life, the ability to protect principal, uh, the ability to avoid losses. But I think in the strategic combination with other products, they become uh, a linchpin of a retirement income distribution strategy. So if you believe, for example, like I do, that a lot of consumers are well served with a bucketed strategy, having a prominent role for index products in that bucketing strategy just makes a great deal of sense. Uh, very good points, David. Uh, let's get a little bit more into how these products work. Uh, Mike gave us a really strong start there, but uh, there are also some mechanisms that affect the return to the client, correct? So, Mike, uh, I'm going to turn to you again to talk a little bit about, a little bit about uh, participation caps, point to point. How do those things work? So, from a manufacturer standpoint, uh, there's really two things that impact the return to clients. Number one, index performance. That is the main engine that impacts the interest credits that a consumer gets. If the index that they select is performing, the options come with value, we can produce uh, interest credit, the stuff that I just went through. So that's the number one impact to what consumers get. The second is participation rates and caps. And from a participation rate pers perspective, think of the participation rate as the percentage of growth that the consumer can receive. So if it's 80%, they get 80% of the index return over that period of time. If it's 70%, it's 70%. If it's 150%, it's 150%. So it's uh, participation rates have more upside um, because you're participating in whatever the index does. All okay. right, from a cap standpoint, the stated cap is the maximum interest credit that the consumer can receive. So on a 9% cap, they can get anything from zero to 9%. On a 12% cap, they can get anything from zero to 12%, uh, depending on whatever the index does over the stated period of time. To me, those are the two main things that impact consumer return. But I wanna go back to what David said. I want you to remember, why are you buying FIAs and RILAs? It's for some sort of protection, right? And so you have to keep that in mind as you're thinking about the returns you're expecting from these types of products. Mm -hmm. Okay, good point. And we're gonna get back to that a little bit when we talk about rising interest rates. I'm curious to how those numbers maybe are changing. Um, so, but first, before we get there, uh, uh, David, you've been a, a, a vocal advocate for uh, registered investment advisors using annuities in retirement planning. Uh, you, you got into it a little bit with the bucket strategy, but um, talk a little bit about how these index products can uh, help your clients meet several needs at once. 
So a couple of points you brought there, which I'll, I'll capitalize on bringing up the RIAs. I, th I think it's, it's sheer lunacy for an RIA to not embrace annuities. And I'll tell you, there's a, I'm going to talk about this later, but I'll bring it up now. You know, the greatest force behind the growth of index products, in my thinking, going forward, is going to be the phenomenon of women taking control of upwards of $30 trillion of investment assets. The RIAs have a problem because what the RIA serves up generally is not what the woman tells research that they want. So the proposition, the golden value proposition of an index annuity of you know, upside growth potential without downside loss is in perfect harmony with what this phenomenon seeks in terms of women taking control of all of these assets. I think that's gonna propel the growth of index products to levels we've never seen. And unless the RIAs come to terms with annuities and start to think about eliminating what I call the great mismatch, their inability thus far to relate properly to the woman buyer and to give the type of advice and product set that they want, what will continue to happen is what has happened, which is evidence in the statistic that seven out of 10 of them lose their clients after the husband dies. So there's a lot at stake for that channel. And I, I know it sounds very simplistic to say this, but embracing annuities is one prescription for what, stopping that plague, if you will. Mm. Uh, several uh, interesting uh, ideas there. I'm, I'm sure we'll get back to those. Uh, but let's talk about sales strategies. And I'm sure uh, uh, a lot of our attendees will be interested in this content. Mike, uh, at Nationwide, what are you uh, stressing to your producers to um, connect, connect with clients and ultimately make sales? Yeah, so I'll tell you what we're seeing, what producers are sending to us or what the data tells us from uh, the sales that we're receiving. And, you know, we, in general, are selling about $5 billion of uh, fixed indexed annuities, and we're selling, you know, over a billion dollars of registered index link. So this is about a $6 billion pool that I'm sharing data on. And so the first thing uh, that we recommend is clients should always work with their financial advisors to make sure they're getting the best solutions for them or their immediate needs. The top two items that we're seeing, uh, protection or some level of protection. FIAs are being used for 100% protection, can't lose money with some upside potential. For RILAs, you're getting some level of protection, your choice, you can either do that in a floor or a buffer, uh, depending on what you fear most or where you, the protection you want most of, hey, I want immediate, uh, I'm willing to take up the 10%, you know, five, 10% loss in my portfolio, uh, I'll use a floor, or I'm willing to take uh, the higher percentage of losses, but I don't wanna lose anything from zero to 10 or zero to 20 right, your buffer style. Um, both of these types of products, in my opinion, produce more upside potential than your standard fixed investment. One of the top ways that these uh, products are being positioned is a bond replacement or a bond alternative. If you think interest rates are gonna continue to rise, uh, this is a great way to use the insurance company's uh, general account. Uh, as a buffer from a rise in interest rates, right? The second way is um, money that you can't outlive. We are seeing about 70% of all clients add a living benefit to their policy. So they are valuing, consumers are clearly telling us feeling safe and secure is important to them from the sales that we're seeing. The other two strategies that we're seeing a little bit uh, use this pure tax deferral or accumulation, uh, typical annuity benefits, not really related to either index or not, but tax deferral. And then the last one is really legacy planning. Uh, hey, I've grown this money or I've accumulated this money. I don't think I'll need it. Uh, so I'm going to add some sort of death benefit to it. So it grows for the, you know, my beneficiaries. And those are the four main things, mostly 
principal protection and, and income you can outlive. Very uh, versatile products. Uh, so, uh, David, I'll turn to you here. Are, are there any, let's call them uh, X factors that could uh, boost uh, index uh, business? Well, one was just what I just alluded to, which is the phenomenon of the women's wealth, you know, that clearly I think will. Um, interest rates that move around a lot, maybe go up, you know, they can change the dynamics of the pricing of options. You know, bond yields that generate more income can create more, more um, money to buy options and perhaps increase participation rates. I think that's another thing that, that could make a big difference. Um, people getting afraid of stocks. If we have some real serious volatility in the stock market, you would think that that might hamper the index purchase, but I don't think it would. I don't think people lose um, their faith in stocks as long as they can be protected. Uh, so um, I think there's. it's hard for me, John, to draw a scenario where index products run into a big headwind here. And if the, the one exception perhaps would be if we were enter enter into a psychology where people lose faith in stocks uh, and fundamentally lose faith in stocks, and I'm not predicting that, then I think insurance companies will pivot. They will have indices for bonds, right? So the, the index is not going away. The value proposition is not going away. It's just going to grow and grow and grow. Well, uh, let's, uh, let's talk about that. Uh, interest rates are uh, obviously very good now, and uh, there's, you know, the markets are up and down a, a little bit schizophrenic here over the last 18 months. There's talk of a recession. Uh, inflation seems to be coming down, but it's it's a real mix of uh, economic uh, indicators out there. Uh, Mike, you want to come in here? I mean, what are you seeing with uh, uh, how are those uh, economic factors uh, impacting uh, index product sales and, and how folks are looking at them? Yeah, so to David's point, um, consumer value, I'm, I'll look at it from a manufacturer standpoint, uh, consumer value is directly correlated to interest rates. So the higher interest rate environment, the more consumer value we can add into annuities, right? And so I agree with David that we should, you know, as, as interest rates continue to rise or stay flat to where they are, depending on what you're predicting, um, or potentially go down, that's the consumer value that we can ride. Now, remember why you're buying these products. It goes to what David said, in my opinion. If you're worried about pure investment into the stock market, there's ways that you can still get upside potential with levels of protection. And that's the role that these products will play, no matter what economic environment they are, you're buying them for protection. Okay. So let's Talk about the uh, typical consumer, uh, typical customer for these uh, index products. Uh, does your, um, I'll ask you both, I mean, does your targeted uh, customer uh, skew in any particular direction or age demographic? So, I mean, for me, I, I have a construct that I believe in called the constrained investor. Constrained investor is the person who gets the retirement which savings, which is great. But the amount of savings they have isn't high relative to the income that they have to create to have a, a you know, a, a minimally acceptable lifestyle. What that means is they have enough money to retire, but they don't have enough money to make mistakes. And so for that type of buyer, and there are millions and millions of them in the United States, the index product is the perfect solution for all the reasons we've been talking about, because it gives them the upside growth potential that they'd like to have that could conceivably, you know, be you know, fixed investments but protecting them from the losses that they can't tolerate. One of the huge, most important losses that they can't tolerate is the notion of timing risk or sequence risk. You know, And if you can avoid sequence risk as a constrained investor, you're, you're, you're already giving yourself a much better chance of having long-term success in retirement. So the index product can deliver that protection. We should be talking about that you know, more and more, I think. Uh, yeah, um, that's a good point. Um, uh, when you're looking at the stock market uh, over time, you know, you're going to see gains, but it, it's that uh, big loss that can hurt someone nearing retirement. So, um, I mean, how do you, 
I mean, how do you address uh, uh, that particular objection to um, for those folks that are nearing retirement? Are they uh, out of the uh, out of this uh, market for an index product, or um, would are you, you talking to me, John? Did, were you directing it to just throwing me? it out there. Just throwing it. Well, out. Let me. I'll just make one more comment on it. You know, I, I point out an example that if you had two people who had exactly the same financial profile, the same amount of savings, the same amount of uh, retirement income, the same portfolio. The only difference is they're separated in their dates of retirement by three months. One can go completely broken. One can end up with millions of dollars. Nobody should sustain that risk. No one. And if you can simply buy an index product and do away with that risk, you're giving yourself a really good chance of being successful. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yep. Well, John, what we're seeing, uh, again, um, we're seeing the typical customer is usually conservative to moderate, I'll call it. They value protection or some level of protection. Um, they want some upside potential or some potential growth. Um, let's at nationwide, typically the buyer of our products are within 10 years of retirement. For our Fixed indexed annuities, the average age, if you're just accumulating and using it for pure, pure principal protection and upside, average age is about 60 of the consumer buying it. And then if you're adding the income rider, the average age bumps up to about 63. 80% of people are diversifying and selecting more than one index. That, uh, by doing that, you're lowering your risk of getting a zero. Uh, return because you're diversifying just like any other strategy. And at Nationwide, we're seeing about 70% of people add the income rider on these type of products. That's for fixed index annuities. For our registered index link or our RILA, the average uh, purchase age is around 64. Okay. Yeah, that uh, zero floor is certainly uh, a big selling point for folks nearing retirement there. Uh, how about some common objections and or uh, misconceptions about these products? I mean, what are you running into out there? And I'll so throw David, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll take this one and then sure. uh, David can jump in. So from my standpoint, uh, I'll think I can think of a couple. Uh, off the top of my head. So number one, FIAs don't work in low interest rates or high interest rates uh, environments. Um, you just heard David say and myself say that, you know, in high interest rate environments, uh, the consumer value goes up in annuities, right? So I do think that they can work in high interest rate environments. I also think they can low, work in low interest rate environments. We just came out of them and both market segments continued to grow. Why? People are valuing protection or some level of protection, it's clear, right? So that's the first misunderstanding or misconception that I would say. Second, FIAs are equity replacements. FIAs are fixed products. They get fixed like returns, all right? They are more a bond alternative than an equity replacement, all right? And then the last one in my mind uh, is financial strength of the, of the insurance company doesn't matter. Uh, these are long dated obligations, specifically when you're buying protected income or income you can't outlive. Financial strength absolutely matters, in my opinion. So I'll add a dimension to this from a different perspective, going back to the RIA community, because I hear a lot of objections from RIAs about indexed annuities and annuities in general. And I wish it stopped. Uh, first of all, there's no justification for criticizing the value proposition for all the reasons we talked about. Uh, but the, the criticism that says, well, that's a commission. I don't deal with commissions. Let's give it up. You know, we have a big industry. We can tolerate all kinds of compensation schemes in this industry. And, you know, let's be honest about it. If a client is going to put $150,000 into buying an annuity versus $150,000 to buy an investment account with an advisor, uh, who's going to make more money over five to 10 years? It's the financial advisor whose uh, you know, annual uh, AUM fee is going to provide a lot more income to that advisor than the insurance agent would have made as, as a commission. So I, I'd like to see that hypocrisy go away. You know, I would really wish that that would happen. 
because uh, the investment advisors, you know, take, take the money out of the height of the client, whereas if you keep that insurance uh, vehicle, that indexed annuity until the surrender charge period is waived, you, you don't pay a commission you know, as, uh, as, a, as a consumer. So we have so many advantages. We just need to be strong and, and you know, not fear for explaining, you know, where we are here in terms of our advantage set. You can tell I feel strongly about this. <laughs> um, yeah, I was going to uh, bring this up later, but it's it's good right here. Uh, I know Nationwide uh, introduced a, a fee-based uh, index annuity, I believe, some years ago. And um, uh, just removing the commission from the equation uh, does defeat a lot of those uh, objections. Um I mean, how are you seeing uh, fee-based products uh, grow? And my understanding, it was uh, very low growth, but uh, are they catching on? Yeah, so obviously Nationwide uh, believes in fee-based annuities. Um, several years ago, we made a decision to acquire Jefferson National, which was the leader of selling fee-based annuities in the industry. Uh, we have taken them uh, as part of Nationwide and we too have a full suite of, of products. Has fee-based, to David's point, um, has fee-based, the fee-based industry, annuity industry grown as anybody expected? Absolutely not. Uh, and I do think it's because some of the things that David shared is we need to get over that annuities can play a role in retirement savings plans, right? And so are we seeing growth? Absolutely. Should it be more than what it is today? I'm a believer of that too. I completely agree with you. Okay, uh, let's take a little break here. I think uh, Ashley has uh, another uh, good poll question for us. Yeah, the next poll we have is what index products are selling best in your world? Registered indexed linked annuities, fixed indexed annuities, indexed universal life insurance, or none of the above? All right, John, we have about 55% um, having success with fixed indexed annuities and about 40% with indexed universal life insurance. Okay, well, that's that's uh, uh, to be expected. All right, let's move on to talk about uh, regulation, uh, uh, my favorite topic. Um, I know uh, both of you gentlemen uh, are following uh, developments uh, on the regulatory front. Uh, you can't be in this business and not be following it. Uh, several different levels, uh, in particular, uh, David, you mentioned before we before we went live that uh, Department of Labor fiduciary rule is, is a concern. Um, I'll I'll throw it open to both of you. Um, what what are the best and worst case scenarios? I mean, what? Well, I mean, I, I guess we should level set where we are, but talk a little bit about what the Department of Labor is working on and, and what are the concerns with it. Uh, Mike, you want to go first? Uh, you're on mute. Oh, David, did you want to jump? I thought I heard oh, yeah, you. No, I, I, I'll, I'll start. I, I think the best outcome is best interest. Uh, you know, the, the model reg that has been adopted by 40 states, it's being, you know, worked on by six more states. The best interest framework gives us something that's understandable. It harmonizes with the independent advisor or agent business model. We're not deemed to be fiduciaries. Uh, in all cases, we can continue on and service people in, in a way they should be serviced. You know, I'm an advisor to an organization called FAC, FACC, which is the Federation of Americans for Consumer Choice. It's a nonprofit organization that was started by Kim O'Brien and has been the leader in, in working against the, uh, you know, ill-founded, in my view, proposals from the Department of Labor, sued the Department of Labor in February of 2022 to stop their interpretation of the five-part um, test, and has, has been very successful thus far. We really can't tolerate the DOL's perspective here, in my view. They will kill the independent business. Um, and if we end up with the best interest contract, which I tend to think we will, that will be the best outcome for us. 
Yeah, uh, you know, I don't have much to add to that. Uh, from my standpoint, best interest is hard to debate, right? You should always put the consumer's best interest uh, in front of yours. And, you know, speaking as a person that invests personally, uh, consumer choice is important to me. Let me decide, right, what's best for me and my family from an investment perspective. I can do that through a paying a commission. I could do that from uh, an advisory fee, whatever I choose um, or whatever I'm most comfortable with. So, okay, uh, very good. Uh, I guess we'll find out uh, soon. I, I would expect that uh, the Department of Labor will release its uh, fiduciary proposal and then we'll see what happens there. I imagine it will go to the courts. Um, uh, the SEC has tried to regulate indexed annuities, indexed products as securities. Uh, you, you, you both have been around long enough to remember Rule 151A, 2009, 2010. I mean, any concern over the SEC getting involved again uh, if the White House remains uh, under Democratic control through the next uh, three 2028, any concerns with the SEC coming in? Uh, for myself, I, I I don't know how to think about that, to be honest with you. I, I'm less concerned about the SEC than the DOL. We have registered versions of our products today. We have fixed products that are clearly fixed products. I think it's hard to argue they're securities. Um, but Mike may have a different view. I'm not sure. Yeah, how, how I'll answer this is... Uh, from a nationwide standpoint, regulation, we just viewed as new opportunities. Um, what I know is that we will continue to design product with the consumer value in mind. And the consumer value for these products, they're speaking loud and clear. They provide protection and they value that. Or they provide lifetime income and they value that. And so, you know, regulation, it will, we'll just have to work through the regulation of where it falls. But we know if we can continue to about their deliver consumer value, they'll continue to buy them or use them. Okay. Uh, I've seen a lot of concerns from regulators, uh, particularly at the state level over some of the indexes. Um, Mike, uh, which, which index uh, does Nationwide use? And, and talk a little bit about that and, and, and why, why you favor that index. Yep. So, so we have a variety of index. Our view, one index is not better than the other. They all work differently, and they're all designed to get different, you know, work in different economic environments. Um, so here's a few things that I would think about as I'm purchasing these products or using these products. Uh, number one, they're used for protection. You're buying some level of protection, primary goal. They're not equities, they're fixed assets. And the last thing I would say is you need to understand the investment philosophy that you're purchasing. They all work differently, right? They all, they're all designed to work differently in different economic environments. Uh, and, you know, the last thing I would say is we would recommend, you know, when you're selecting them, you're selecting more than one index. We're seeing about almost 80% of people select multiple indexes. Mm. Okay. Uh the uh, the index is an issue um, as it relates to illustrations. I guess illustrations are the issue for a lot of regulators at the state level. Um, uh, we haven't talked a lot about life insurance, but uh, AG 49A, AG 49B, maybe AG 49C to come. Um, any any concerns about uh, illustrations being too high and attracting the attention of regulators? Um, I mean, David, it's probably for you, you probably deal a little bit more with IUL. Um, well, illustrations. it's interesting. You know, I started as a, a distributor, wholesale distributor of life insurance, universal life insurance in the 80s. And, you know, the illustrations were 11, 12, 12 and a half percent, 10 and a half percent. And I can tell you, uh, as, a, as a wholesaler, where thousands upon thousands of policies were, were written by agents under my hierarchy, none of those illustrations came true. 
to what was projected. Now, the way the industry has worked is that, as, as you know, the illustration wars cast the company with the highest projected value is oftentimes getting the sale. I think we need to move away from that construct. And I think agents need to be more confident and talk about themselves more as opposed to the illustration. Why am I a better agent than the next agent? Why will I help you as you navigate this journey toward through and toward and through retirement? Where can I provide value as, as, as your counselor? I think that is, is more important than the illustration. I, I don't have a lot of necessarily you know, credence in what illustrations show. I think they're only a picture in time. And to have company A selected over company B because it had 12,000 more cash values 30 years from now, I don't think that's the basis of competition. That makes sense. So I don't know if I'm answering your question exactly, John, but uh, I, I kind of like to way, move away from the current paradigm. Okay. Uh, just... Let's uh, look ahead to um, uh, what we could see in, in index products. Uh, this morning, I was looking at uh, a report uh, indicating that 13% uh, uh, annual growth rate for index products through 2027 uh, internationally. But um, obviously, the, they're going to remain strong sellers. So uh, I'll ask you both about you know, what are some innovations that we could see in index products? Uh, um, like I know Nationwide just recently launched a new Ryla product. Uh, why don't we start there and tell us about that? Absolutely. We are extremely excited about our new product uh, and, the, and how it fits into our existing product portfolio. So uh, it's Nationwide Defender. You know, it's designed to be simple. It allows advisors uh, to tailor fit the solution for consumers, right? And so it's pretty simple, five well-known indexes, S&P 500, MSCI, EFA, Russell 2000, uh, S&P Midcap 400, and NASDAQ 100. Those are the five indexes that are available. It has two buffer protections available also, a 10% and a 20%, and it has three strategy terms. You can either pick one year, three year, or six year. Um, the other thing that it has is one of the features that Nationwide is well known for is Nationwide Spouse Protection. It's included. Uh, that allows two death benefits to be paid. Um, if either spouse dies, it allows a, a death benefit to be paid, no matter if it's qualified money or non-qualified money. And so the two products work together. We already had defined protection, in, uh, which is a registered index link annuity in the market. Uh, and we're coming with Defender. They work together. If you want protection with growth, DPA is your answer. Define, define protection product is, is the answer. If you want growth with protection, that then Defender's your answer with a buffer. So that's sort of the new product that came out, how they work together. They're not replacing each other. They're, they're designed really to work together. And depending on what you want, what protections you want, the two of them work differently. Mm -hmm. All right. Now let's talk about maybe what's coming. My prediction of what might be coming. Um, as the numbers that you shared, John, uh, we expect continued growth in fixed index annuities and registered index link products uh, for the foreseeable future. I do expect new innovations to happen. Uh, where's the new innovation happen? Personally, I expect more custom payoffs. And what I mean by that is no matter what the market's doing, you might get a payoff if it's up or if it's down, or if it's only up a little bit, you might get a lot more. If it's only down a little bit, you might get a lot more. My hunch is there'll be some custom payoffs that come into the, the market. And then the last thing, uh, more and more indexes. Remember, the indexes are designed to work differently in different economic environments. You're, no one's saying one's better than the other. What we're saying is here's a probability of lowering the chance of getting zero if you believe this economic environment is going to be for X period of years, right? And so that's all we're trying to do to me. It's those three things, uh, continued product, some innovation and custom payoffs and more indexes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I believe uh, there are now about 180 
uh, indexes. So that that's a big number. Um, I recently spoke with someone, uh, a company in the Midwest who came uh, has a new product out where it's uh, it's an index product with a bonus that if the S and P goes up a certain amount over five years, you would get like thirteen percent, say. So that's kind of like that custom payoff you're talking about, I guess. Um, David, any, any thoughts here with what's um, coming down the line? Just think about what Mike described here in those two minutes about those two products. I challenge any agent or advisor to find any client that they have or prospect that wouldn't find benefits from those products. We're covering every base there can be to cover, you know, a choice of indices. Uh, levels of uh, protection, absolute protection, different types of upside. I mean, I mean, you got sort of nirvana, you know, the way we've we've matured. Now, that does that mean we won't be continuing innovation? Sure, there will be, but the products from where they were when Keyport came out with this product in 1995, one index, you know, one term, one participation rate, to what we have today, it's an incredible, you know, legacy of innovation that we've seen. And uh, I don't know, I just think people should feel very optimistic about what they can do with these products to, to propel their clients' financial security going forward. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> uh, I was uh, mentioned previously about the uh, interest rates and the um, caps and how that might be affecting it. I wanted to come back to that, uh, Mike. Um, are the are the caps rising as uh, as folks see interest rates rising and they can go to fixed money and get five or six percent, does that mean the caps are rising uh, along with that? Yeah, that's exactly what's happening. Uh, I bet you if you go back and look at anybody's uh, rate sheets, uh, particularly ours since January when rates started to come up, you I would almost bet that you're seeing monthly increases or when rates go up, you're seeing increases in caps or par rates. Um, to the indexes, 100% directly correlated to the consumer value. Think of that. We're going to buy bonds, right? We go and buy bonds. Those bonds produce a yield with interest rates rising. Those yields are elevated for the insurance company. We take those bonds and we go buy participation in the index you selected. So if we're if we can go get 6% yields, made that number totally up, if we can go get 6% yields, we can then take 6% and go buy participation on that index. Just a few months ago, right? Let's go back to uh, late last year. If we were only getting 3% on the bonds, we can only go buy 3% uh, options on those same indexes. So yes, uh, directly correlated and participation rates do go up with rising interest rates. Mm. That's what uh, fascinates me about this industry is Every bit of news is, is a little good and, and a little bad, but it all kind of fits together. Uh, it's, it fascinates me. Uh, just uh, before we get off this topic on uh, innovation here, um, I was at a conference in the spring and uh, the speaker talked about a life insurance version of a uh, registered index link product. I mean, is that uh something that uh you all have heard about and will we see life insurance rilas maybe down the line would not surprise me uh if we see that uh i don't necessarily feel it's as compelling a need uh and serving as compelling a market as the annuity but um it would not surprise me at all if we if we saw it i'm in the same camp uh you know when I talk with my peer, he usually looks at the annuity industry as a leading indicator of what happens on life insurance. And with the you know increase of Rila products, it wouldn't surprise me that uh, we see a light version into the future. Okay, great. Uh, I'm going to uh, go to uh, Ashley now, and I do think we have some questions that have come in. That's a lot of great information, guys. Thank you. We do have a few questions here. Um, the first one is for Mike. Uh, Mike, what is your capacity in the FIA industry and or max funded IUL space? 
Yeah, so the max funded IUL, I'd have to get back to you, but I'll talk uh, from the FIA space. So Nationwide is a A-plus rated carrier. If Nationwide Financial was a standalone company, we would have uh, AAA capital levels. And so from a capacity standpoint, from my perspective, we're well capitalized. Uh, some of the best. Our RBC ratio that comes out on an annual basis is top quartile, usually the top one or two insurance companies in the in the industry um, from that. So we're well capitalized and have a, um, you know, we look forward to increase capacity into the future for these products. Last thing I will say is our product strategies that have a diversified product portfolio, and we do that for sustainability reasons. Each of the products work differently in different economic environments, adding stress and non-stress. And so we, what we want to be able to do is be in it for the long haul, no matter what the economic environment is. Uh, and we love the product mix that we're seeing today. Uh, we, you know, we, we haven't uh, left any of the markets. Uh, we just continue to expand. And uh, that is definitely part of our strategy. Excellent. Thank you. Um, what are the most popular riders you are seeing with index products? Well, you probably are better for that question, Mike. Given yeah, the... so I'll speak for behalf of Nationwide, and then if you have any <clears throat> other concept, the main riders that we see, 70% of all of our consumers uh, that we purchase or that purchase from Nationwide uh, are buying an income rider. And so definitely seeing uh, consumers speak with their dollars that income they can't outlive is important to them. I echo that. From from what I see as an observer of multiple advisor firms and multiple companies, I think that's just right. Great. Thank you. All right. This one's long. <clears throat> With all of these custom indices, how many market makers are available to grant options on the index? Given the likely death of participants, couldn't that have a negative impact on pricing if we have any market disruptions? Yeah. So I'll, I'll take that one from a manufacturer standpoint. So. Uh, this is how I'll describe it. Nationwide to add an index to our products needs uh, millions of dollars of capital to build it, change marketing materials, get the message out there, right? And so from an index selection standpoint, we make sure that there's plenty of capacity before we would ever add them into our products. Um, we also work with the index manufacturers and the backers to make sure that we can get options from not only the creator, but a sub person if need be. And then lastly, from a nationwide standpoint, uh, we have a really robust hedge team. And that hedge team works on making sure that if, uh, if at any time we needed to execute the trades directly by ourselves, we could absolutely do that. So capacity is key before we would ever add an index into our product. We know exactly how much capacity there is uh, and how much we'd be willing to write. Great, thank you. We have a couple more here. Um, are you seeing higher surrenders now that interest rates are higher? We're, we're not, I'll speak on behalf of Nationwide, we're not seeing higher surrenders that are, interest rates are higher. It's, it's my sense, same, but uh, Mike would have perfect knowledge in terms of nationwide, obviously. Great. Um, how do you respond to critics claiming that indexed annuities come with high fees? <laughs> I'll, I'll try that one. The highest fee is an investment loss. If I can avoid a 10% or 20% or 30% loss, I mean, you know, that's that's an extraordinary advantage for the client. I, I just, I, it doesn't even rise to, to almost uh, a level of, of, of response. It's so ridiculous. Everybody has to get paid who's in this business, whether you're an insurance agent earning a commission, investment advisor earning a, a, an AUM based fee, everyone has to get paid. And that's right. And, you know, I, I wouldn't challenge that, but to categorize something as having a high fee and saying it's no good, it just doesn't make sense to me. Uh, you could say that an investment advisor charging one and a half points of, uh, you know, AUM fees is, is a high fee. Why, why not charge six basis points? 
right? Well, maybe the investment advisor is earning that because he's providing great service to the client. So it, it just doesn't rise to the level of being an intelligent question. And I think, you know, I wish people would, you know, move away from that sort of mental framework. Great response. Thank you. Mike, anything to add? No, I would, you know, personal, it's a personal one. Uh, insure it's expensive when you don't use it. Think of anything. Well, I'm paying a lot for that. I never use it. The minute you need it, you're glad you paid it. Right. These products are insurance products. And by, by the way, one more thing. These critics, these, these are the same people who would never get in their car without car insurance. They would never leave their home uninsured against the fire. Why should you leave your income uninsured? And there's a cost to insuring your income. There's a cost to insuring your life. There's a cost to insuring everything. So I wish people would rethink the objection because it just doesn't make a lot of sense. Those are great points, David. We have a couple more here. Um, can you explain how volatility controlled indices work and why that is a big buzzword right now? Let you go, Mike. Yeah, so uh, here's how I'll describe volatility controlled indexes. One of the ways um, volatility controlled index or volatility is the cost of the option. So in order to get more stable renewals, in order to get more stable pricing, volatility controlled indexes were designed and developed. Think of when interest rates went down and the bond yield that you were getting was you know, 1% and you had to go buy participation of an 18% volatility controlled S&P 500. You weren't getting much participation. Right, so these indexes were designed to allow increased participation um, from an, uh, and caps and par rates uh, that you have. So to me, that's one of the main reasons why they work. The value of them are they're very stable, right? And so when you're renewing, when the terms end and you have renewals, these are set volatility. They try to, and so you shouldn't see much movement in participation rates or caps. That's one of the benefits of them. Great, thank you. Anything to add there, David? No, I think that's a, a terrific explanation. I think that's just right on. Perfect. All right, we have time for one more question here. Um, what are some of the tax and even inheritance advantages to using fixed indexed annuities? Well, tax deferred growth. That's one tax advantage versus a lot of other alternatives. Yeah, I would say those are the key ones. Tax, you know, tax advantage, tax deferred growth. And then, Ashley, what was the second part of that question? Tax advantages and I missed what it said. It says even inheritance advantages. Yeah, I mean, I'll speak on behalf of Nationwide uh, from an inheritance. Like if there's death benefits out <clears throat> there that are legacy planning benefits that these products can pr provide. Um, I would make sure that you you do do your homework on them. Just like Nationwide Spouse Protection, it's one of the only places in the industry that you can get a death benefit for either spouse uh, on qualified money, right? Yeah. And so those are some of the advantages of some of the products that are out there. And beneficiary receiving money from an insurance company obviously aren't going to have probate. That's another estate advantage. Excellent. All right, John, that's all we have for today. Great. Uh, thanks, Ashley. And uh, I think we can give folks back about five minutes. But first, uh, I want to thank our panelists, uh, Mike and David. I know I learned a lot. Uh, thank you for uh, sharing your precious time and insights with us today. So, uh, Ashley, why don't you close us out? Yeah, uh, thank you for attending today's webinar. You will be receiving an email with the recording as well as a link to sign up for the next webinar in this series, Securing Futures, The Power of Life Insurance Across Generations, which will be on September 13th. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.